All right. Well, welcome everybody to our session uh, this afternoon. Uh, this this afternoon, we are uh, privileged to get uh, to have with us some uh, Climax Conseil uh, advisor, uh, Jacques Thériault and Isabelle uh, Vichitil. Uh, they're both going to be with us for the presentation. The presentation will be given by uh, Elisabeth and uh, Jacques will be uh, taking a look at the chat box, make sure there's the questions are answered. So again, people, you uh, feel free to intervene, ask the questions, or if you prefer to lift your hand, you can you can do that. And the questions that are uh, relevant to a lot of people, we'll make sure that we pull the questions out of the chat box so we can have a, con a conversation uh, together. So with that said, uh, Elisabeth, uh, please uh, begin your presentation. Thank you, Claude. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome everybody to this uh, session, second uh, chapter about the production of uh, transplants. So today we're going to be talking more about the practice. Um, I'm going to share the screen. Um, I guess uh, you see my presentation. Um, yes. Yes, it's good. Okay. So here's a little recall. In chapter one in December, we saw um, how to choose uh, resistant cultivars, uh, the calculation of quantities and propagation space, and then the propagation calendar. And we've seen the equipment and facilities that you need to get in order to start well your transplant. So we're not going to get back on this on these uh, elements today but some um some points are gonna come back of course because it's the following uh, chapter to this session so here's our goal today um the goal of making great uh, transplants is to reduce the heating cost between planting and harvest by ensuring um that the plants will be as advanced as possible before planting, while the eating cost per plant are minimal. When you're in the nursery, uh, you're heating probably one third of the greenhouse instead of the whole greenhouse, so it's way, uh, way cheaper. So uh, you, we want to make sure that the plant will establish itself as quickly as possible following the planting. So you want to have them um, with leaf development that is uh, that is um, that is uh, sufficient to support the aerial and the root grow at the same time. So here, um, in order to do that, we're going to start by uh, to determine the stages. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna give you some charts for each um, crops, and before that, we're gonna set all the elements of the charts. And then we're going to check the charts together. So first we determine the stage we're talking about, and then we will uh, determine the parameters of control that we need to um, control. <laughs> uh, the temperature, the 24-hour temperature, the watering, the spacing, the EC, and the humidity. These are the main uh, elements that we, we think are uh, the basis to make a great production. Then we're going to look at different charts. We made charts for uh, tomato, cucumber, pepper, and eggplants. Um, so we're going to look at these together. Also, we want to talk about preparation and uh, running your systems before you start. Uh, we're going to talk about hot water seed treatment. treatment. Uh, we'll also talk about prevention of disease and insects. Uh, we're going to talk about how to fill the cells and the pots. We're going to talk about watering tools, uh, EC reading methods. There's two of them. We're going to see how to do that. We're going to talk about the pinching methods, the double head, especially for tomatoes. Um, also fertilization for seedling and transplant. The soil preparation, getting in the greenhouse uh, before planting, and then planting and rooting. So that's the program. So if we start with cultivation stages, for each stage, certain parameters are different and also for each culture. So let's first define the stages. 
So the first stage in our chart will be from the sowing to emergence. We're talking here about the moment between the planting and the seed, the planting of the seed and the emergence. That is until the cotyledons are deployed. It is here that the lightning will become necessary as soon as the germ uh, become apparent. So you'll need 40 watts per square meter in the PAR um, in the seedling chamber. That the lightning element, we've talked about it uh, last time in chapter one. In this stage, especially the recommended temperature at this stage, it's the temperature of the potting soil. This is very important. The sensor has to be in, in the soil, not in the air. Second st stage here is from emergence to transplanting. So we talk here about uh, the moment between the cotyledons are deployed until the transplanting. The recommended temperature at this stage, it becomes the air temperature in the seed uh, chamber. So the sensor will get out from the soil or you have two different sensors. Then you have the transplanting. So transplanting usually is the first leaf have reached four centimeters. Uh, usually the plant has three or four leaves, but the first one will have about four centimeter. And that's usually the, the, the moment where they start to touch each other in the trees. The root ball should stand to be um, transplanted. So usually you'll see in the charts, we recommend to use the 128, but to seed one and two, as we've talked in chapter one. And this is usually um, the best size to have um, uh, aerial uh, development and have the roots that uh, will hold under. And just a reminder here, uh, there's no transplanting in the cucumber. Then the stage, the other stage, we call it the spacing. Okay, as soon as the plant will touch each other in the pots, um, we space them to give them all the light they need and avoid, avoid the etiolation or the stretching. The kind of light that uh, they receive when they are all stuck together uh, in the shade, it's a light that, um, that pushes the vegetative uh, side. And what we want by spreading them and giving them more light, we make stronger plants, but we also initiate uh, the first cluster um, faster. Sometimes there can be a difference between six leaves under the first cluster up to uh, 12 leaves. So that makes a long difference. It makes a good difference in, in, the, in the time of production. And the harvest will get faster. So that's one reason why we need to space. We recommend to space only one time, but at 12 heads per square meter of table, of uh, surface of table, um, we we will space them to this um, distance, um, only to limit the working time. You can do it slowly, go at uh, 25, and but then you'll spend your time spacing them and you'll move them a lot. So that's why we think that when you when you put them at 12 heads, then the step, the next step, will be getting in the greenhouse. So when you get in the greenhouse, again, we do it for the same reason. We want to give them all the light they need and we need to avoid etiolation and stretching. <coughs> It's, it's for the same reason. Uh, so that way you space them only one time, you save some time. Usually it's one week to 10 days before the stage of planting, okay? And usually when we bring them, when they are due to, uh, when they want more space, they usually have six to eight true leaves. When we talk about true leaves, we don't count the cotyledons. And then you have the stage of planting. Planting is when we put the roots in the ground. So to do that, we want to have enough roots as well. Uh, yeah, we, want, we want to have enough roots and we want to have enough leaf. So for tomatoes, usually it's eight to 10 true leaves. And we want to have um, the first flower open at about 25 to 50% of the plants. For the cucumber, it's usually four to five leaves. And for the peppers, uh, we want to really see the, 
the first Y really clearly visible. For eggplants, usually it's about the size of a 12 inch, one foot. So now let's uh, define a little bit the parameters that we need to control. So there's the 24 hour temperature, there's the watering acclimatization, the spacing, the EC and the humidity. So first the temperature, the 24 hour temperature. Here we are giving you in the charts, we're gonna see just uh, in a few minutes, uh, we're talking for sowing, uh, spring sowing, which has natural light from the transplanting stage. That means if you make your pots in the uh, in a in a building or in your uh, basement, and you have only artificial light, then we should maybe uh, check with you, or at least you should reduce the temperature that are in the charts, because we 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 um, we took in consideration that there will be uh, natural light to recommend the, the temperature we put in the charts. So. Um, there are respectable range of targets from the temperature that we suggest. So being one or two degrees below, uh, that will result in just strong plants that have a little bit extra energy that will make really uh, strong plants. If you're being four to six degrees below the targets, then it will make plants that are way too vegetative and it will increase uh, the cost because you're gonna heat a little, but still for a longer time and you won't have the, the results you want. Also, as we said <laughs> earlier, if um, so the, if you put the right temperature, the delay be between the seedling and the harvest will be shorter. That way you, it makes you be able to um, start the season a little later and have maybe an extra week of vacation. So if you think about it that way, <laughs> it can be very interesting. Um, uh, there's no day and night difference like between temperatures during this period. Uh, we're looking for really uh, the vegetative development. Of course, in the greenhouse during the day in uh, April, March, April and May, the light is so uh, is so uh, strong that of course the temperature will rise a little and you can adjust your night temperature. But uh, we want to say don't make uh, don't try to get an average of 20 by keeping 30 during the day and 10 at night. This is this is not good. Your night temperature has to be warm enough. And why is that so important to heat at night? It's because you need to unclog the sugar that are accumulated in the leaves and that will assure the plant growth. The plants making photosynthesis synthesis, and the sugars are in the leaves and the temperature during the night will um, let the plant use this sugar and make uh, new leaves, new stamp, new roots. If it's too cold, the sugar will stay in the leaves. And then on the next day, it won't be able to take some more and grow some more. OK, so then, of course, if you eat at night, it will assure optimal photosynthesis on the next day. Also, it will reduce the cell elongation because if the sugars are stuck in the leaves, that will attract water from root pressure and that will make your cells bigger but weaker. Avoid the, it will avoid edema and gutation also due to the lack of sweating. So that was for temperature. Now about the watering. We aim for balance in the availability of water and air in the potting mix. This is very important, the water and the air. As the transplant will grow, you can dry out more and bore between the waterings. The young roots are uh, very uh, sensitive, so you need to, it's like babies, you got to feed them <laughs> every two hours after uh, at the beginning. So. Um, and as they grow, they will be able to to um, to wait a little bit in between. You'll be able to space your watering, and that will bring more air also in the in the mix. And it's also necessary to follow the evolution of your roots. So if if the roots are on top on the surface, you want to uh, um, oscillate between humidity and dryness, but on the surface. 
And if the roots are reaching the bottom, then you dry and you wet the bottom also. So if the roots are just on top, but there's water on, on the bottom, you still have to water the top. That's what it means. And many times uh, people ask, uh, do I water? Am I ready to water? Is it too dry? Is it, does it need it? So here is a little technique, a little calculation to make your watering uh, timing decision way much more rational. And it's a calculation you can make at first. And if you note your, if you note uh, your, um, your, um, your numbers for your, your trays and your plants, then you just need to have um, a balance to be able to weigh your, your, your trays or your pots. And that will help you take your decision of the right moment to water. So this technique, at first you're going to weigh an empty tray and record, record the weight. Okay, so for example, I have no idea if it weighs 50 grams, but let's say it weighs 50 grams. Then you will fill a tray and water it and let it drip for about an hour. Once the dripping is done, you can weigh the, weigh the, um, the tray again and note this number. And then we, we uh, you have to know it's considered as the dry peat is worth about 10% um, of the way at its maximum of water retention. So in our example, if the full water tray is at uh, 1200 grams, while well, 10% from that is 120 grams. So if we take off the 120 grams of dry matter, we take off the 50 grams of the empty tray, we end up with 1,030 grams of water content. That's the maximum we have in the tray for the example. So let's say we're going to see uh, further. In post-emergence, we give you the, um, the, the tip to uh, water to a maximum of drying. No, we, we suggest to water. <laughs> no, we suggest maximum drying of 30%. Sorry. So. To find out 30%, you have to take your water content, multiply by 30%. That makes 309, 309 grams of water that has to be out of it. So to know when, when to water, you weigh your tray and you take your 1,200 grams of the, of the beginning and you take off your 309 and it makes 891, 891 grams. So that's a number. So if you say, well... Before, when I reach 890 grams, I water. That's for the 30% dryness. And when it grows further, we will recommend you to let it dry to 50%. So to go to 50%, it's the same calculation, but 130 grams multiplied by 50%, that will make 515 grams. So you'll water when, when your plate at the end will reach 685 grams. So of course, these are examples. You make your sample in your in your greenhouse, and then you take note of them, and then you know when you know when you reach your thirty or once you reach your fifty percent, and the decision is way easier to take. It's also a good technique for both trays and pots, so you can do the same thing with the pots, and it will tell you uh, when it's ready to water. Usually when we water, we will give an order uh, of uh, a number of seconds or count up to three, four or five. And that is to uh, create a watering that is uh, even from one tray to another or from one pot to another. Um, be aware that the borders, the peripheral, peripheral cells of a, of a tray of 72, it's 44% of your tray. If you count the cells, it makes 44%. And many is the time we go in nurseries and we see the ends of the borders, the, 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 the end of the table is all dry. And that makes, that makes a, it's a good proportion of your production. That's what I want to say by, by this little point. So keep that in mind, the borders, they're not just border, they're a, good, they're a big part of your production. Um, also, validate that the watering time that you suggest to your employee or that you, you're using yourself 
uh, it's going to go down to the bottom. If you say water three seconds and it was just half the pot, you're going to have to do it again. So just validate. And then one, one out of uh, three times, maybe you can uh, aim for a light dripping to rebalance your uniformity. So you might give a little bit more than what you want to make sure that all the all the pots or all the trays are getting back to their their um, their maximum of capacity. That way, everybody gets equal, even. Also, water from the from above from the top. We don't recommend to water from the bottom because uh, there's danger linked to the transmission of diseases. And also, when you water from the bottom, the salts are gonna go up and stay on top of your um, of your cells or uh, of your pots. So it's very important to water from above. Also about the watering. Sufficient supply of air to the root, so drying out, will help create a strong root system. You can supply water and it's hard to supply air. Well, the way to supply it is not to water. <laughs> so in hydroponic, we promote the what we call the air pruning by drying the root in the peat. We try to oxygenate the young roots that are in the center of the pot to stimulate the branching. If you water too much or too often, you don't let it dry. Let's put it this way. If you don't let it dry enough, you will have a pot that has roots around. But when you open the when you open the pot, when you open the root ball, there will be no roots in the middle. And the reason for that is that the roots are reaching for air around the pot. So that's why uh, letting the air come in in the in the in the middle, it will create a better. Um, root system and when you would you will uh, take take the root ball it will go like and then you feel there is it's really holding it's really uh it's really strong and that's what we're looking for and if you have a root ball that's this way it's really going to grip the ground much faster when you're ready to plant it We've talked uh, mostly about watering by hand or manually, so there's also uh, the possibility of installing drippers with the French capillary. capillary. So, yeah, this is French uh, capillary. Pay attention to the flow and uh, pressure. And also, if you are uh, fertilizing with solid fertilizer later in the pots, well, of course, you will still need to uh, water by the um, by the top water with the the, the little shower to make sure your fertilizer will be um, wet in order to uh, to pass. So that was for watering. <laughs> Here's for acclimatization. Okay, so uh, you gotta watch out when the um, transplant move from one environment to another, or even from uh, one light to another one. Okay, you wanna avoid the wilting by drying or by heat. Once you bring your, your transplant in the nursery or you bring them in the greenhouse, one or these two steps, uh, make sure your watering tools and your ventilation is ready and working before it, your plants arrive in the nursery. If you reach all your plants and you didn't plug your watering and then you're missing a valve and of course it's Saturday afternoon, well, you're in trouble. So if the transplants spend a long time under artificial lightning only, of course, uh, uh, in the case of um, if you do your transplanting in a, in a building or in your basement, uh, maybe you should think of uh, a shade tarp um, to make a little acclimatization for the plants because they will have uh, quite a shock when they get in the greenhouse, especially when you're doing this in the springtime. Okay, and here it comes again. Well, just so you remember, the objective of spacing is never have the plants touch each other. Um, and you want them to have uh, each the same light and you want to avoid the etiolation. That's why we do that. That's also um, in order to, um, so the, the appearance of your first flower cluster that will get earlier. 
so your production will get earlier too. So this is happening when the plants are very small. So I'm I'm saying it twice, but I want you to remember it's not just for fun to space the plant is to make them uh, strong, but it's also for the flower to come early. And now about the electric conductivity, the EC, it measures, it's the measurement of the mineral content of the soil solution or potting mix solution. Uh, there are different targets according to the stage of growth that we're going to see in the tables. Um, like, like we said for the watering, there's also um, the small roots will uh, prefer lower concentration and as, as bigger as they get, they less they, they get less uh, sensitive. So when when it's too high, there's higher osmotic pressure that makes the access to water that is more difficult. So the fragile little wrong, young roots, they're more sensitive to that. And one sign that it might be the problem, the, the electric conductivity is that the 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 transplant or the seedlings are gonna get very dark and withering, withering. Um because you can have you can have uh, seedlings that have water but still uh, wilt and and this this could be because the EC is too high and so they are not able to take the water. Also, if your EC is too low, there's a risk of a lack of uh, food deficiency. Also, turgidity will create fragile plants and they will be weak, they will be pale and etiolated or stretched. Air humidity is felt as cold by the transplant if it's low, low air humidity. So uh, this is why we will space them out gradually to create a microclimate in the foliage zone. So the step of spacing is very important. And another reason why we do that is to keep them still together for a while. In that way, even if the, the air humidity of the green of the nursery can be dry, in in the the zone where the plants are, they will feel it a little bit higher. It's a a problem that is seen uh, uh, mostly in the winter sowing or in seed uh, chambers. So uh, in the greenhouse nursery in the spring, it's much less of a problem. Uh, but if you see it still, uh, you can water the soil three times a day if the humidity will drop uh, drops um, below fifty percent. And we'll look at the tomato chart more in detail. And I, I have like three other charts and we will after more just um, pinpoint the differences. So I don't know. I think I will do like I did on the other session and and stop the, um, the, the, the diaporama. Just wait a second. How do I do this? Here. Mm -hmm. Here we go. That way you can see much better. So here, this one is for organic tomato for spring sowing, of course. So if you're you're seeding um, uh, earlier in the fall time or beginning, well then temperatures uh, should be adjusted a little bit. But most of you guys are doing spring uh, spring sowing, so we we um, focus on this on this for now. So on top, you have the different stages that we we defined earlier and little description of what we're talking about. So um, that's pretty much for the tomato. Uh, the first ones when you seed this you the seed is sown and then your sprouted seeds with the from the cotyledons that are deployed until the transplanting. And then when you transplant that first real leaf at four centimeter, until they touch and then you space them. And when they touch again, you space them at 12, uh, 12 heads per square meter of surface of table. And then as soon as they touch, then you can bring them in the greenhouse. And once 25 to 50% of the plants have an open flower, then you can plant. Different densities, so the 410 
uh, seed, sprouted seedlings per square meter. That means the 128 seed at one and two. So it's a 64 uh, that gives that gives 410 per square meter. And then if you're making double heads and if your double heads are, are pinch uh, in the nursery and not, not later in the greenhouse, we're going to see it later. But usually if you have double heads, you should put 43 pots um, it will make 43 pots, but it's it's when you transplant, and it's or you can make 86, but then you should um, spread the no, you should space them twice, and then you space them at 12, and then the density. This is your plantation of density for the heads, and 2.7 to 3.5. It's depending you're making beef or cherry tomatoes, and even sometimes it can be lower than that can be more 2.2, 2.5 for really big tomatoes. So that's that's the density. Then there's the line of the 24 hour temperature. I always remember it's 24 hour temperature, so it's an average. Um, for the, the stage of sowing to emergence, it's the potting soil temperature. So for tomatoes were 25 to 27. And that's in order to have your seed come out fast and even the temperature that are recommended in the diff different charts if you're if you're um, a lot colder it's going to be longer and if you're too hot it might come but very uneven um and also then once it's once it's sprouted then it's the air temperature so here are the the ranges that you have so it's depending on your greenhouse it's depending of on how the plant uh is reacting um if it's cloudy if it's very sunny there's different element that will uh give you um that will give you the tip of you know being at 22 or being at 26. And of course, we're talking about 24 hour average. So during the day, if it's going up a little, well, then your night can be a little lower. But as I said before, don't don't um, don't go in the extreme of it. You can go a little bit, but not too much because you still need to have a night temperature that is high in order to um, make the make the growth. Um, yeah, one thing I didn't say earlier, but that is, that is I think, uh, interesting is to know when when it's getting too uh, too hot and when it's getting too cold. Well, if you're too hot, your plants are gonna stretch. That's first thing you're gonna see. They're gonna the 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 space between the leaves are gonna get longer. And if you're too cold, they will be dark, but they will also be very um, um, stocky. So that's that's a little link. And the more the bigger they get, you'll also see the head that's coming out. The for the the apex of it, you have your different leaves, and really the small head with the new leaf will come out on top of your leaf if you're too hot. And if you're too cold, the head would be will be in. We talked to head in and heads out. And that's that's what you have to look in order to decide, am I going at 22 or 26? Am I at 22 or 25? You're going to be in between and the plant is going to tell you. Uh, the humidity here, uh, these are recommended um, relative humidity ranges. And of course, when you're in the, in the nursery uh, in the springtime, especially like in April and beginning of May when the leaves outside are not there yet. Well, many times the humidity will get will get lower. And if your plants have enough water, you don't have to worry. Sometimes you'll reach that instead of being at three to seven grams per uh, cube meter, you can get to 10 or even 12. But uh, what you have to do is just make sure they have water and make sure there's enough fertilizer too. Because if you water more, you will drain a little bit of fertilizer. Uh, the EC in the substrate, of course, uh, it's like I said, it's going from lower to higher. Uh, sometimes we think, oh, we're going to put a lot of fertilizer at first. That way there's enough for a while, but it's not the way it works. So here you're in the um, in the seedling, the seedling mix. So the seedling mix is usually uh, less uh, kind of less. Um, rich 
yeah, less less rich. And then the second, the transplanting mix, then we'll we'll already have a bigger uh, amount of fertilizer. But you can't you can't start too high, and you will have to fertilize once you reach uh, here. Probably you will need it. We'll talk about it later. Here, the 2.5 and 3, it's good for the pot, but it's also good for the soil when you transplant. So make sure that there is fertilizer in the pot, but also that you're not putting the pot in an empty soil. We will talk about fertilization a little further. Here, for watering, for different stages, like we said uh, earlier, um, for sowing to emergence, uh, many is the time we say um, keep it humid, but instead of keeping it humid, just think you have to prevent the seeds from drying out. You don't want to drown them. You just want to make sure they don't dry. And uh, to do that, there's a good uh, good tip is to cover lightly with uh, vermiculite or fine potting soil, just a little bit, maybe two, three millimeters of it. And that will help you to um, keep it humid. And once you water, water the sides too. And sometimes just, you know, you will see the color too. It will get light brown. That's uh, another sign that it has to be a little bit more. But don't drown, but prevent from drying. Uh, and then as, as they grow, then you can dry the 2 to 30%. And then later on, you'll be able to dry up to 50%. Just uh, be aware of the drying out when the plants are large, like the week before you plant, they really, they really take a lot of water. And sometimes you have to rewater. You have to make a touch up in the afternoon to avoid being at 80% uh, dry in the morning the next day. So that's one thing you have to watch once you reach uh, bigger transplants. Um, there was little notes here about the humidity. I said it already. And yeah, the reading of the EC is good for the pot and the soil. So this is the chart for tomato. And then we have another chart that's, this one's for the cucumber. And we're gonna check it because it's, there's little differences. So for cucumber, as we said already, uh, we sow them already in the um, in the four inch pot. So that's why the density will be at 98 per square meter. And um, then from emergence to, I would say second leaf pretty much, and then you'll have to space them. Uh, here, the temperature can go down. So 28, 28 is for the potting uh, soil for cucumbers. It's a little warmer than tomatoes. And then you can drop the temperature a little as it goes. And then um, the same spacing, we're still at 12 per, um, but that, that, will be, that will be very short period. And then at four to five true leaves, you can, you'll be already in the greenhouse. Uh, the densities, of course, they're depending on the type of cucumber you're making and uh, also the tutoring way if you're doing umbrella or you're doing the um, high wire technique. Uh, here for humidity, I won't repeat. It's the same thing. And of course, it gets dry, but uh, just don't forget to water and they will they will make it. Uh, one special thing here for cucumbers that they, they are sensitive to the EC to high EC, so, um, and EC, EC is one thing you can control because of course you're gonna have, uh, for many of you guys, you're gonna have uh, uh, many crops, many cultures in the same uh, environment. So you'll have to choose to follow one or the other. And probably, uh, I think for the most, the most um, common, uh, a uh, scenario is that the tomato is most of the time the bigger crop, tomato or cucumber, but usually tomato. So the climate will follow, you'll follow probably the climate of the tomato and the other crops are going to follow. And as you will see, they will probably be a little uh, under the temperature that would be perfect if you had just cucumbers or if you had just peppers. But um they ju it, ju it will just make your um, your transplants um, stronger. 
but one thing you have the you have the the chance to control for each separately is the EC and the watering. So uh, be be aware of that. And the cucumber, the pepper, and the plant we're gonna see they they like the EC lower than the tomatoes. So just be careful on that. This one is this one is uh, specific to them. So again, you prevent them from drying out. Um, you can cover with the uh, vermiculite or uh, fine soil. Uh, the seed of the cucumber is bigger, so you can put a little bit more. And yeah, so that's good for the cucumber. And we'll see. Just a little rem reminder, don't forget you sow them in sow them in the four inch pot and uh, they're sensitive to high salinities. Okay, here is the chart for peppers. So here in the stages, the transplanting usually is at is when the first true leaf come out. So that's just a little smaller than for the tomato. And then uh, the planting stage is when the first Y is clearly visible. And it's important a larger plant at planting will have better fruit set. If there's something you have to remember about peppers is that um, the peppers, they need enough leaf, enough foliage in order to set fruits. They can set one fruit at the beginning, one or two. You remember the pepper is made as, as a V, so there's a first, then there's two, then there's four. And if there's not enough leaf, uh, it will not be able to continue because after four, it's eight and, and then it's it's more so uh remember one thing the peppers they need to have foliage in order to set the fruits remember that and one thing that is also important to avoid sometimes the peppers you make just one row on the side and the seedlings are in a tray somewhere it's important to space them because when they stay all together they stretch and the leaves on the bottom are gonna drop and as i just said a few seconds before the peppers, they need their leaves so badly in order to make fruits. It's good for all the crops, but this one is, this one is, it's something we saw, we see too many times. The peppers are on the side and then they lose their leaves. So that's pretty good for the peppers, I think. Oh, yes, one element, the density. Uh, the density for peppers and for eggplants, it's the same thing. Uh, we consider them as double head. But the double head is the is the V. So in the in the chart we seen at chapter one, the density recommended is from um, five point six. Well, five point six, you're gonna still see just two point eight, half of it, and then the second head will be uh, will be your V. And it makes sense very clearly when you when you. Um, when you put the ropes on them and you really conduct them with two heads. But for the ones that uh, that do the trellising on the horizontal side, uh, we don't count the heads so much. So that's why I'm talking about this. We count, we still count them as they have two heads, but of course they will, they will stretch and make more heads. But just take in consideration that the 2.8, it takes, it takes the V in consideration. I don't know if I'm clear about this, but I just want to just want to make sure. And yeah, and the EC again, it's the pot and the soil. And then the eggplant, I think for the eggplant, well, there's mostly uh, the size of planting, as I said before, it's 25, 30 centimeter, that's uh, one foot high. And soil for the germination is 26 to 27, and then you drop it to 23, 26. So you see the tomato was at 22, 25. They would take a little higher, but they might they might live uh, perfectly at 22 to 25. Uh, the EC also, they're sensitive. They're like cucumbers, so just be careful. You can always choose to, uh, you know, when you make your measurements of EC, well, you'll measure different crops and you will choose to fertilize only the ones that really need it. That's one thing you can really um, 
have control over that. So I think it's good for the charts and I will go back to here. I see better. So just again, general uh, features or particularities. So again, covering them with vermiculite to avoid the trays to dry out. Um, in your di diversified greenhouse, uh, one will follow the climate of the main crop and usually will take the tomato and then the others will adapt. In the springtime for spring sowing, we have enough light. We're not we're not uh, stuck with the the temperature so much. We're not. Uh, we have a gap. There's way too much light, anyways. So it's not. It's not a. Um, it's not a big concern. They will. They will just be a little stronger if the temperatures is a little under for the for the other crops. I'm talking about eggplants and peppers or crops that you make in in smaller amount that you can't just drive the climate for them. Uh, remember, the EC is the element that must be particular to each of them and the watering, of course. And be careful when uh, watering the pots. Um, when the plants are becoming large, sometimes you have to rewater uh, before the next morning. So here's one slide. Before, before you sow, did you test your equipment? If if you are looking for 28 or 26 in the in the potting mix, do you have 26 or you're at 22 and then you'll take two days before it reaches the temperature? The it's like uh it's like the the clock is starting once you put the seed in the in the in the soil. And if your equipments are not working properly, well you're already uh, getting late on your schedule, getting late on your production. So maybe it's a good idea to one day or two days before, make sure your potting soil is at the right temperature. Make sure that your heating is capable of maintaining uh, the request temperature at night. That is important. Otherwise, instead of uh, sprouting in five days, you will sprout in 10 days. That's already five days. <laughs> So it can go really fast and it can create, that's all little elements. I think it's next, next slide or soon we're gonna talk about uniformity. Make sure, uh, look for uniformity in every little element and that's one element. Every time you're losing a bit, then you're getting late, then it's the yield at the end that you're not making. Uh, another subject is uh, hot treatment, hot water treatment for uh, for the seeds. Um, it's mainly used to present the risk of bacterial disease from uh, from that come from seeds. So uh, mainly for bacterial canker. And this treatment, they will make it possible to reach the bacteria that's present inside the seed. And um, what it will do is that it's going to delay the contamination. You might have the contamination from in from uh, outside later but if it's not starting from the beginning it's less damage in the harvest or when you when you start your harvesting uh one point that is not there that is important is that be careful um sometimes the seeds they are primed they are like pre-germinated they call them primed in in english i think and um you can't treat these seeds <laughs> Be careful to that. Um, ask your um, uh, fournisseur, uh, your retailer. So uh, that's just one element. And uh, especially, especially the rootstock. Many times the rootstock, they are prime already. Uh, prevention of insects. So the main active insects in the soil, they are the trips, the siarid, and the shore flies. Uh, why we talk about this now is just uh, because the control, the preventive control can be done before you get in the greenhouse. And it's happening pretty much in the same period at the same uh, time of the year. So I'm, I'm making a little reminder to, uh, to order these things and to um, apply them on the soil. And just for the trips, to give you an idea, it can reduce up to 30% of the, of the, 
the adults that will uh, come out in the in the springtime. And remember the the uh, the this not disease the the digger. How do I put that? Um, the damage. The damage. <laughs> Thank you. The damage uh, is uh, more important on small plants and on transplant and on small plants than on bigger plants. So it's important to start early. And as we said earlier, it's uh, always good to have a prevention plan for insects. And and when you know what you had last year, then you know what to work what to work on uh, next year. But this slide was just to tell you because it's all happening at that time of the year. So put a reminder in your telephone and check your calendar three weeks before you plant. And then four weeks before you should order. So you can use Tratiolae Labs, you can use Galeolae Labs, and you can use uh, Demazis. The three of them, they work on uh, on these three. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Stratiolae Labs and Galeolae Labs, they also eat some mites. Uh, yeah. Then for disease prevention, uh, it's uh, strongly recommended to colonize the soil, the potting mix and the soil with uh, Trichoderma ar arzianum, which uh, its commercial name is root shield, and it works against Fusarium, Pitium and Rhizotonia. It can be used as pellets in the potting mix and, uh, and also in the soil or uh, as a wettable powder by watering. You can, uh, you can send it through uh, your irrigation system also. It can be done during, uh, during the season also. Uh, moisture in your soil or your potting mix, that's more potting mix I'm talking about here, um, before you fill the containers and the pots and the and the trays. It's always good to um, um, moisten it before to avoid overwatering at the beginning because the peat needs quite a bit, uh, and especially if you're having an organic uh, organic uh, uh, organic potting mix, um, they, it's hard it's hard to um, make it wet. So do it before and the properly moistened uh, soil, it will spring back when you compress it in your hand, it will still uh, spring back. If it does not, well, it's too, it's too wet and you have to be careful not to make it lose its porosity. The potting mix, their first quality we're looking for is porosity for, for the roots to develop really good. So just be careful of that. Avoid filling the cells and pots too too far in advance and stacking them. You can make them maybe a day or two and and stack them, but cross cross them not not like this. That way they won't um, they won't uh, compress. But the trays, we want to see the separation. This might look a little uh, picky from me, but I seen a lot of trays that are filled over top. And then when you water them, the, the, um, the potting mix will go out, will spread out. And sometimes your seed is in there. It also gives you a little space where the water can retain there. So um, make sure you see the separation. And then you can shake the tray or just drop it once. And then you remove the, the extra over. Don't tap it too much, okay? The subtract, it must remain light. We want to keep its porosity. So for the trays, uh, you can leave uh, one of uh, eight, one eighth of an inch of soil to prevent the water to run off, like I said, when you're watering. And for the pots, well, fill them up to the, li the line over here. It keeps you uh, some space for when you're watering. That way the water won't come out of the pot. It will stay in and... Uh, it will uh, help you with the uniformity of your watering. And it's also if you want to add solid fertilizer during the cultivation, which it's not if, it's you will need to. So <laughs> keep a little space for it. Also here for watering tools, uh, the mist is used for sowing, but after the cotyledon stage, it becomes risky to damage the foliage. So then you will spit, switch to the spray handle with a low flow shower head, like you see uh, over here. Uh, have a valve to adjust the flow. 
Watering is one one key of making you do you, uh, really beautiful transplants. So I don't think this is such a big investment and it will really help you to give the amount of water you want to give <clears throat> the right way. You can control your pressure. Sometimes you have a difference of pressure in your in your system. That way you will you can keep it very, very regular. So again, aim for uniformity in everything, filling the trays all even, sowing depth all the same. That way the seeds will come out more even. The watering should be even too. And then your temperature and climate, um, try to have it as uniform as possible. And one thing uh, I didn't say earlier, but uh, if if let's say uh, where you're at your climate you're driving the temperature for the tomatoes but let's say your um, your peppers would want it a little uh, lower or maybe you can think the side tables are 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 cooler or it's warmer close to the heat and then at the end of the greenhouse there's little drop temperature so you can use that also thinking who needs what and and play with that a little bit, but still try to have uniformity in your in your climate too. And also in the spacing, try to give them all the same the same space, the same light. Uh, the greenhouses that have the best yield, they are uniform on each step. They make sure everything is done even. Uh, here are the EC. Um, there's a mistake here, EC and reading, EC uh, reading meta methods. So there's two possible methods. You have in the multi-cells or in the pots, we're going to use the method that we call the P-juice method. And most um, post-planting, -plant once you're in the greenhouse, you're transplanted, then we use the two-for-one methods. So here's how you do. For the P-juice method, in the multi-cells or in the pots, um, you will wait about an hour after watering. Uh, if you want to have a constant uh, measurement from one reading to another to another, uh, your your water amount should be pretty much the same. So that's why we do it after the watering. That way, it's it's um, it's more uh, regular. It's the it's pretty much its maximum of capacity, and it's it's more um, uh, it's the same. It's like it really tell you the same information every day. If you do it, let's say if you do it in the morning before you water, well, the dryness can be different from one day to another, and um, if it's dry, if it dries, then the the concentration of minerals becomes more concentrate. But are you at fifty percent dryness? Are you at thirty? Are you at fifty? So if you measure when you're at hundred, you're reading from one day to another. You will really have the information of how how uh, lower it's getting or how higher it's going. I don't know if I'm clear here in my explanation. So you take a small amount of potting soil and you compress it in a clean container and make sure you have clean hands or otherwise you wear gloves. And why you need to have a clean container and clean hands, especially the clean container, if you reuse the same container every day, well, if you leave it there and it dries, the salts that were in the little juice from yesterday will dry and then it's salts that will ruin your measurement. So one good way uh, to have it clean is just rinse it out and wipe it. That way there's no um, there's no uh, depot, there's no uh, leftover of minerals that's, that's uh, making your reading um, not good. Uh, then... Then when you have the juice, well, then you just make put your reading and you read it directly in it. So that's for multi-cells and, and pots too. Once you're in the ground, you use the two for one methods. 
So again, for the same reason, you're going to do it when the ground is wet. So probably usually uh, before noon, when your your watering of the morning is is done and that the soil is pretty much as its maximum of capacity. Um, then you'll take four to six samples of uh, root zone in a depth of uh, 15 to 20 centimeter. Uh, and then while well, you'll previously remove the first centimeter or at least the, the I will call it the creamage of fertilizer. <laughs> What's on top? Usually it's one centimeter, but you really don't want to have the fertilizer in the pot because the reading you want to have is what's in the what's in the what's in the soil and what's really in the solution. So be aware, especially if you're you're bringing your K mag or something in in um, in pellets on the ground that can really really change your reading. So just be careful of that. And then you mix the bulk sample in a clean container. Again, I'm very picky on that. If you don't want, if you want to have a good reading, you don't want to um, make your reading uh, wrong. Well, then use a clean container. So again, you will use another clean container that is graduated this time. So here you see an example where we we uh, we made the the graduation very clear. So you'll fill two parts of it with distilled water. So here we go, we're up to 400. And then we will uh, add the soil to reach the third part. That's the two part, that's the one part more. Then you will stir it well and wait 30 minutes. And then you stir it again and wait five minutes. So the suspension will go down. And you'll take then the reading in the supernatant and multiply it by 1.8. And we multiply by 1.8 because this technique makes you uh, put a little bit more than one part. It's like if it's not taking consideration that there's air in your part, but it's the way to make it the most um, regular. Uh, you can take a sample. If you, if you take your sample apart and you count the air, then it won't be, um, you know, one time will be more tap, next time will be less tap. So when you do it like that, you're always, you're always um, doing it the same way. That way you're reading from one time to another, another will be um, the most uh, true that you can get. So that's for the two for one. So that's the method we use once you're in the soil and you should take it before you plant to make sure that the, the soil has what it's need, what it needs. Now we're going to talk about the pinch pinching methods, so the pinch methods for the double head. So these techniques are the two first are just for the tomatoes and the third one will be good also for the eggplant. So there's three possibilities. You can pinch to the cotyledons. You can pinch at the third leaf, or you can uh, pull a sucker under the first cluster. So here's the first technique. You cut it to the cotyledon. And this will allow you to position the plants in a V and one head on each wire. Then the second uh, technique is you cut at after the third leaf. So you get the two cotyledons and first, second leaf. And the third leaf will be cut over here. This little yellow line, I don't know if it's clear. And you you should wait that the this third leaf has a little, um, a little stem of about a centimeter. That way you're sure that you're pinching it. Because if you pinch too small, it might just grow back instead of starting the the two heads and that will create a plant like this the third um, method so you have a you you start your plant with one head and once the first cluster come out you will select the um, the cluster that's right under this one is the the stronger one so that's why we choose this one. And uh, usually when you do this technique, you're already in the greenhouse. So this this head, the first head already has a rope. And usually what you will do is you're going to let the head bend and the sucker 
that is there, the second head will go on the on the main uh, rope, and the second head, um, sec and the first the the first one is gonna is gonna fall, but that will give the light to the second one, and then you will add the second um, the second rope will come here. Like let's say this this first head will fall on the side, and then the rope will go for this one to give its light. This one will bend on the side. And then the rope will be put and then it will follow the rope to reach about, usually it's about six inch, six, seven inch in between different plants. So we'll have to reach it and then go back up. Uh, Elizabeth, it's it's really hard to explain if you don't really see it well, because it's it's a counter, yeah. it's counterintuitive. Like last year was the first time I hear I heard that technique with you and Jacques, and the growers were all puzzled with it, like why? And but there's a big reason why why you do that. So uh, maybe we'll have to spend in a future a bit of time to explain it with with really good images so people can follow. Yeah, what, yeah, because what you're I'm saying. I'm very small. I think on your on your screen, huh? <laughs> well, no, it's it's it, it's okay. But we'll we'll have to revisit this one. Yeah. Okay. So here's a chart. It's coming from uh, Agri Réseau, and it's listing a little bit the advantages and uh, disadvantages on next slide of each technique. So if we just take the time to uh, look at them, if I go in the same uh, order as I did first, we'll go with the two stem at the cotyledons. If you pinch there, the two stems are very equal, and the plants will be very uniform. It makes generative system, which gives the first uh, bouquet or the first uh, the first cluster very low on the two stems. However, if you're you're doing your seedlings in the winter and the light is poor, um, maybe you have to uh, plan on your your um, on the 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 amount of fruits you're going to keep on the first cluster. So, but in your case, in uh, spring sowing, it's not a problem. Uh, if we're looking at the two stem at the level of the third leaf, if we pinch the third leaf, uh, it's easier to get the suckers out because you already have, you have cotyledons and you have also the two leaves that are doing photosynthesis. So it's going to go quite fast that the, um, the suckers are going to come out and they will also grow a little faster because of the two leaves that are there helping. Um, so it will go a little bit faster. Uh, it also gives generative uh, system and the first bouquet will get very low also like like the other, uh, like this one here. I don't know, I forgot the pointer. So like this technique for the two of them, the, the cluster should come early. Uh, for the third um, technique, once you, the one that you take the stem uh, under the first uh, bouquet or on the first cluster, um, the period of preparation of seedling in the nursery is short. It'll go fast, making plants with only one head. Uh, it goes fast. Also, it takes a little less space. And um, so that's that's the, the main advantage of it. Um, here, the disadvantages uh, here for the cotyledons. Well, if especially if their light is poor, the emergence of the suckers, they can it can take a while. So it's a little longer. Um, it will also grow a little slower than when you work on the third leaf because the cotyledons are very small, so they can't do too much photosynthesis and accumulate sugars. So there's a little delay over there. One thing I like, I like about this um, this uh, technique is that you can pinch and well, it's good for the for those two. You can pinch and uh, transplant in the pots at the same time. You create only one stress, and the energy you take off from the top will go and stimulate your roots, and then it will then it will really uh, come out. Uh, one disadvantage for these two also is that the um, the splitting is quite low and um, 
by by having two heads in the pots, uh, many is the time it, it it might crack uh, if you don't put the ropes uh, fast enough, and you know they can become fragile before plantation, and and also when you put the ropes in the V, uh, it can crack from the from the, the 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 bottom and it's very low it can be a door for sicknesses to come in so that's one disadvantage of it you got to be careful but it means it means you can't be late in your jobs and you can got to make sure that they stay uh standing still that they're not like falling on each side of the pot and um here for the 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 technique of the um, the cluster, the the sucker that you take under the stalker, the you know under the sucker. <laughs> sorry, under the cluster, the sucker that comes under the first cluster. Um, there's a risk that the stem will not be equal, and like I said, and we can uh, see it after once I take off the the um, presentation, or I don't know, maybe I can. Aha, uh -huh, maybe I can draw it. I think I can do that. Uh, let's say you have your main head. Is it working? Yeah, I got your main head with leaves here. And um, here's a cluster. Okay. And here, or maybe it's going to be on those. Anyway, the sucker starts here. Okay, so this is the one you want to keep. And you have the rope. The rope is here also going up okay this is the rope so this head the first head you will have to let it bend so it's gonna go like this okay i'm making the same plan and you're gonna let it go this way that way the sucker that is over here will take the place of it okay and it will keep on the main rope okay my drawing is really bad I don't know if it's helping. And then the second rope will come from the top and will come to clip under here. And by letting go down this one, you're making space for the light here to come. And that way this one has room and has space and has light. And that is so that this small sucker will grow to become a head the same size of this one in two weeks three weeks you don't see the difference so i don't know if my drawing is helping claude actually i i i think it is because most people will say i will take i'll take the string and i'll attach it to the main head but in fact what you want to do you want to take that main line or main uh string and attach it to the new the new head that's coming and yeah, then and then you tie tension. right Be because there is tension so this one will grow straight and this one has a little bit of advance so it can it can bow for a while and go use the room in between because your plants are uh uh it's much wider because you plant only one head you know so there is room in between. So this one is in advance. This one is taking the room and it can go on an angle and it's strong enough that it will it will straighten up. And this one, because because if you keep this one on the main, this one will be stuck in the in the leaves because this one has leaves on it. See? And that's where it's going to create what we call the, the little brother and the big brother. The one that stay under that's always keeping small. If you do that, it's, it's, not, it's not helping this one. And you want the second hand to become equal as fast as possible. So that's why you bend the main one and you, keep, you put the sucker on the main, uh, on the main rope. So that's that's the technique, and it looks complicated. But uh, once we're in the greenhouse, we can we can show you. It's not it's not the uh... also oh, well. You have to always let the head go always on the same side, of course, and you have to go on the side that you're gonna uh, as say you're gonna bring down the plants. Like you can't uh, if if this is your direction, 
this is good. But if, because if you, okay, let's say I make another one here and then I made it go this way. And then I send them this way on the, on the, on the sans d'abaissage, on the bringing them down, then this, this stem will make, will go like this and we'll go like this. And then, you know, that's not good. So you decide which side you're going, you decide. And they, are, they all go on the same side. And you can't have one plant on one and on the other because, you know, they, anyway, I don't know if you're getting it, but that was not the point today. <laughs> I think I'm getting lost. Is that OK, Claude, are you? Uh... No, I, I think it's fine. You still have material to cover, so I'd say we, let's let's move on. Yeah, so I think I think it's OK, but if uh, anyway, we can talk about it again if, if we need to. The, the only thing I'd add, and I and we we discussed it a little bit with the first group this this uh, this afternoon, is uh, you know why we're why we're pinching, why we're growing two heads, you know, minimizing cost, uh, and you know especially in the cherry yeah. tomatoes, there's there's plenty of vigor in the root system to allow, you know, for for the root stock to really allow for for great growth from from two heads even more sometimes. So. Yeah. Yeah, so well, well, mostly it's uh, because uh, of the graphing too. Uh, you have uh, half of the plants to graph, so that's one one um, reason why we make two heads. And then, like you said, the the root system, especially for the cherry, is strong enough to hold it. And for the beef, then it depends if the tomatoes are really big or not. But um, uh, yeah, so that's another reason, and also because uh, there's plenty of light. So that's that's the main reason why we do that. We make less plants, and it takes less space. Also, uh, here is double head methods for peppers and eggplant. As I said before, the um, uh, for the peppers. Uh, the second head is the is when it 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 makes the second head by by itself. <laughs> the the plant will split in two like a Y, and then you will add the second rope over there if you're doing the vertical um, trellising, and you don't have to worry about it if you're doing the horizontal uh, uh, trellising. And for eggplants, well, it's again, it's the same thing as I explained in the, the drawing I made. Uh, you keep the sucker that's under the first flower, and you add another um, you add another rope over there. So there's no pinching. That's why I put the slide on. There's no pinching as itself. It's just creating a second hand. Maybe, so that was uh, maybe Claude and uh, Elizabeth. Maybe just add that uh, uh, for a uh, late crop in cucumbers, some people will use two head too without graft. And uh, so we forgot to talk about that, uh, Elizabeth. <clears throat> but usually, when you start with two head, you will have a, a less uh, vegetative crop when you start. And secondly, you will have a longer fruit at, at start. Usually we start with a smaller fruit, but uh, you give a very generative signal to the plant that you will have a longer fruit faster than on uh, only one head per plant. OK. It's good. So we'll, we will add it later. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I don't I don't have too many um, producers that use that technique. I know we could pinch, but uh, yeah, it's not usually, too common. Usually in cucumber, we will use the second, uh, the, 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 the soccer. It will not pinch itself. We'll use a soccer uh, like in tomatoes when we add the soccer at, on the, under the first cluster. OK. Oh, sorry. I think I da, 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 da. one. So organic fertilization. So you have to remember organic fertilizer, they require time to mineralize and become assimilable to the plant. So there's always a delay between when you put it and when the plant can eat it. It's necessary to anticipate drops in the EC to supply the plant uh, continuously. 
The EC reading of seedlings and transplant, it should be measured every two days to respond adequately. You have to know if it's dropping fast or if it's dropping slow or if it's going back up. Uh, so every two days, I think, is uh, very necessary. Um, also, uh, it's necessary to provide a reserve of fertility in the pot for the rooting period. So if you think it's going low and don't think that because you're planting tomorrow that it's fine, there's always a delay. There's about a week before uh, the roots come out and we'll be able to grab what's in the soil. So once you once you plant, it needs to have enough fertilizer for one week in the pot. So uh, that's very important. And also always have some fertilizer on hand to be able to react to fertility uh, declines as needed. So uh, you can use fish emulsion, liquid algae, actisol in small pellets, and uh, small pellets because it's faster. It's the one that's faster, the solid one. And as we said earlier, there's other, other products on the market and just try in the liquid ones, uh, try to have um, a, fertilizer, a fertilizer that has a little amount of nitrogen, phosphorus and, and potass, but um, look for nitrogen first. Uh, of course, and um, we put uh, we put the fish emulsion and the algae over there. They're common, but most of the time it's the price that will decide which product you're choosing. So, but just make sure you have something on the, under your hand when you start, because of course they will need something. We don't know exactly the day, but we know they will need something. So here for the seedlings, usually we use the liquid fertilizer, so fish emulsion or liquid seed, uh, seaweed. Um, uh, the dosage, uh, they will vary uh, from 5 to 25 milliliters per liter of water. Well, you have to read the labels because different, problem, uh, different products have different recommendation and you want to avoid the solution to be too... Um, too salty, the, the EC to be too strong. So very, very important for the product you use, read the label that is recommended. Uh, it acts directly on leaves or on, or at the roots. And it's you have to think it's a short-term solution. It doesn't last long. It acts fast, but it's as, it acts for a short time. Uh, then fertilization for transplants in the pot, we usually uh, use the actisol in small pellets. Uh, that's the one that uh, mineralizes the fastest, and that's why it's this one we use. And use the actisol and not the NutriWave for the for the um, transplant. It's really faster, and it has less um, carbon in it. So the doses you see uh, for a six inch pot, it's one tablespoon, 15 milliliters. And if you're for the cucumbers that are in the cucumbers and the, the beans too will be in the four inch pots, uh, use just a 10 milliliter. Otherwise the, the concentration of salt will be too, will get too high. And as I said before, for cucumbers, uh, they are sensitive to high salinity. Um, the actisol must not be in direct contact with the stems. This is very important. You can burn the stems and lose a part of your crop. Uh, also remember it must be wet to mineralize and to be assimilated by the plant. So it needs to be watered. And like, like we said earlier, if you're using the French capillary, you need to give a manual uh, manual once or twice to make sure it's it start mineralizing. There's a delay between uh, three to seven days to to act. Um, and if 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 you reacted too late or if the EC is going too too low, well then you can use the fish emulsion or liquid seaweed uh, in a foliage foliage uh, spray. Uh, and this is used. Uh, while waiting for solid fertilizer mineralization. So it's like a backup. If you're too low, you put your solid one in the pot and you spray with the fish emulsion or something 
in order to, for the plant not to not to go um, not to starve. It will act direct, directly on the leaves, and like I said on the previous slide, uh, read the read the labels. It's five to twenty five milliliters per liter, but depending on which one you're using, it can be different. Soil preparation. So uh, the tillage, uh, the roto tiller you can use, the rotary harrow, and uh, the grelinette. Hey, grelinette, I didn't know how to translate, but the, the fork here, you see it. How do we call it? Uh, anyway, um, so you're looking for a maximum of 10 to 12 inch of loose soil for roots to establish easily. Um, Caution to soil heating pipes if you have some. And it's used to incorporate recommended uh, starting intake based on your standard ana analysis. So there's no, um, we're not here, we're not talking about any amount you have to bring at the beginning. It's your analyze, analyze, analysis that's going to tell you and it's very um, personal to each greenhouse and to each soil. Sometimes we use that to rebalance different elements, and uh, also your 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 first um, your first dosage of fertilization for the on your plant. It can be it can be um, tilled also in the in the surface of the soil. Uh, mounds. So do you make them or not? You only use mounds if you have special drainage problems. Otherwise, there's more disadvantage along the season. And it's a lot of work. It's a lot of um, human uh, human muscles for sometimes no reason. If, if you know, the, the drips, the drip tapes are going to fall on the side or you're going to have to put to fix them. Uh, the plastic, as you see on the picture, might go down. You have to fix it more than if you're in a straight um, ground so it's really if you have a big uh big drainage uh, problem that you will use that um now the fertilization the soil it should be ready to take over when the roots will come out of the pots so your pre-planting fertilization as i said before the first dose of your fertilization plan it should be applied a week in advance, at least, to ensure that it is available to the roots when they need it. Once the roots are coming out, it's not time to put it. There's a delay of three to seven to ten days sometimes, depending on the temperature, depending on different reasons. So it has to be there before. Uh, also, to be able to mineralize the fertilization, it must be wet and the soil must be warm enough. Here are temperatures for the, this is not the temperature for mineralization, but it's, all, it's the temperature for for the, the crops to avoid different problems. So for tomatoes, it's the minimum is 18 to avoid the potassium deficiency. For cucumbers, it's 20. Otherwise, you have a risk of pitium. And for peppers and eggplants, we're talking about 22. 20. If planting at the end of April and later, uh, you don't need the heating in the soil usually. It's normally fine. Uh, you can use a transparent tarp if you want to rise up the temperature. Well, it's good for the temperature, but it's uh, also good for the weeds. <laughs> so when you, if you use that technique, make sure you have also your, your black and white coverage that's coming soon after. Otherwise, you will have another problem on your hands. Um, yeah, before planting, once you bring the plants in the greenhouse, you can place them each to their to their place, but not put the roots in the ground right away. If the stage uh, and the foliage and the leaf area is not uh, ready yet, it's possible to place them, and it's also possible to get the greenhouse ready, even if the roots are not in the ground. And this can um, reduce uh, a lot of the work that comes all at the same time. Sometimes uh, the producers want to 
put them in the ground faster because the plants are starting to fall, because the watering becomes complicated. So here's a possibility. You can place the pots on wooden slats uh, all the way on the, on, the, on the beds and with their measurements in between them. You can install two drips on top of the plants on the pots held by uh, skewers or um, little sticks like the brochette skip, sk uh, sticks. Um, and then you can even tie the ropes to the plant right away. You just have to leave a little slack in the rope about the high of the of the pot so that when you once you put the roots in the ground, it will go down. That will just give it a slack. It won't keep it really straight. It will keep it with a little angle, which is not bad. And that way it can um, take off a lot of stress of doing all these steps at the same time when you're planting, especially for the watering. Just make sure there's a, there's a drip on each pot to make sure that everybody gets water. So that's that's an idea. Just make sure that also uh, here you can put it on wooden slats. I, I find it's the best, uh, the easiest way. You can also put it on a plastic with holes so that the water will will go down. It won't um, make little um, bowls of water, you know, so you just pick it. And but I find the, the wooden slats are, are very, uh, very easy. Uh, the irrigation system. So usually the most common uh, scenario is four drips per bed, each with manual valves, two on each side. Uh, sometimes you have three on the side and one. That's when sometimes people will plant a little bit, um, not in the middle, but a little bit on one side in order to put the the heat balloon on the side. So that can happen, but the most common is two on each side. If and the other the other possibility is to have five or six, but that's if you have a, a soil that drains too much and especially like uh, sands or things like that. But before adding, you got to make sure your system can hold it too. Uh, the valves are very uh, very good to have because sometimes it's too wet. You want to close one you want to or or at the beginning I'll, I'll see it a little further but at the beginning sometimes you want to use just center ones and then use the side ones so it's not very expensive and you can uh, uh, manage your watering more uh, like you want you know uh, the plastic ground cover well usually we recommend the black on white or the white on black um, the plastic I find it's um, retaining more humidity and it gets the um, fertilizer to mineralize faster. The braided uh, one, it breathes breathe more. So sometimes it takes a little longer, but there's no, uh, there's no um, official, uh, <laughs> official uh, information about that. It's more like experience of what we've seen in different uh, greenhouses. Also make sure you have the, the right uh, width. Uh, you can fix it with the U anchors. And the idea um, of having the plastic ground cover is to avoid the evaporation from the soil moisture. So it saves on your uh, dehumidification. It avoids the development of weeds, like we said before. Uh, it's avoiding the trips pupation. And also it promotes the mineralization of fertilizer, of solid fertilizer, organic. So, and this this is the main reason. If you don't have the ground cover, uh, your fertilizer won't mineralize, and that's for sure. And then it's deficiency problems, and it's it's for sure, for sure, it's gonna happen. <laughs> and then the planting. Well, the planting it consists of putting the roots in the ground. So just press enough to create contact between the roots and the soil. Uh, you don't have to uh, break the ball. You don't have to push too much. It's just make a contact and then cover it lightly. You should not see the bare roots. All the roots should have the chance to colonize the soil. Uh, be careful not to bury the neck of the cucumbers. There's danger for disease. And uh, be careful not to bury the graft. Um, yeah, otherwise you will have uh, um, 
he will have uh, the roots from the, 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 the not the root stock, the, the root from the graph, from the, Sion. Sion. the scion. Yeah, the root from the scion will go in the ground, which if you're graphing is because you don't want the, um, they're not resistant to different uh, diseases. So it's important not to bury the graph. Uh, at at uh, planting, the watering is crucial in the days that will follow the plantation. So the soil must be wetted beforehand to prevent it to, from pulling water from the root ball by capillarity action. You don't want it to pull the water. So it's good to have it wet already. So that's why earlier I said you can have your valve so you can wet your, your soil before you plant. And then once you plant, then you can, once when it's, when it's wet on, on the, the space you want, you can close the sides because there won't be roots there before a few days. So that way you don't soak the sides. So the, the valves are a good idea for that. Then don't forget, you bring the water to the roots and not the other way around. Don't think that the root will reach the water. The water at first has to be where the roots are. And this is, this is one thing we've seen last year and that cost a lot of money to a few of you. <laughs> the drip, the drip should be over here and the other one over here on the root ball. Absolutely. And as as the roots are gonna are gonna grow, then you're gonna move them out and you might move them and then remove them to their final position after. It can be one uh, in one or two, two times. Um it should always be over the root balls. Um, and we will reposition the drips as the roots develop. So you really have to follow the roots at that step. And this is very, very important. At planting, the 24 hour temperature will be reduced by one or two degrees for a few days from, from the temperature we mentioned earlier in the, in the charts. So, and the, the, um, my own. Um, the signal you're going to have that's going to tell you you can increase the temperature is when the crown of root outside the root ball will reach one inch all around. Once this happens, usually you will see the growth and the color of the plant on top that will restart. And it, it can take you between five to two weeks, sometimes three weeks, if the water is not at the right place. But usually in five days, seven days, you should start, should like, um, how can I, <laughs> should, uh, you know, get started. Like it, now it's not transplant, it's, they're implanted, they're, they're, they're good to go. So that's the, you can't, we can't just tell you it's a few days. It, it's the roots and it's the growth that's going to tell you. And the day and night interval, uh, they will begin about one week after the planting. So that's pretty much it for today. Thanks a lot. And now if we have questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. We have we have some time for questions. So please um, just um, you can just intervene. You, you don't need to lift your hand at this point. I always have lots of questions. I, I have one that we, we talked uh, briefly about, but again, maybe we could, should reemphasize the need to be ready, to, to, the need to have that soil ready to receive the crop. So it should have, you know, ample water. It shouldn't be muddy, <laughs> but it should be a bit wet. Uh, the and, and the soil should be warm enough that you can see some mineralization. And um, so, you know, you, you may want to consider applying fertilizer ahead of time, incorporating maybe the first application in the spring, uh, just to make sure that the soil is ready to, to receive that transplant. 
because uh, like Elizabeth said, uh, there was um, there were a few problems in New Brunswick last year that you've seen, and basically the soil wasn't ready for the plant, and and yeah, and the plant struggled for two weeks, even more, and and in some cases we had to remove the first cluster or two from the plant. So that's uh, that's a costly costly venture. I see there's there's people on on the call that are also growing uh, lettuce and hydroponically. Um, you know, Jacques and Elisabeth's here, and uh, so if you've got some questions on on crops that are not necessarily fruiting crops, um, there's an opportunity for you to ask a, a few questions now too. Well, if there's no question, or maybe we'll wait a little bit, but again, this uh, session is recorded. The plan is to post it on the Department of Agriculture website uh, with the presentation as well, so that uh, people will be able to 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 look at uh, the video again and the presentation. And um, if I'm not getting any more questions, I think maybe we'll end the conversation now. And uh, again, I will we'll thank uh, Elisabeth and Jacques uh, for putting this uh, session on. And I, there is uh, a lot of work involved in translation, preparing, and adjusting presentations for, for the New Brunswick crowd. So I, uh, we are very appreciative of the time that you've put uh, on this. And uh, maybe I'll end by saying that we will we we'll see a Climat Conseil folks at the Hort Congress uh, scheduled for middle of March coming. So uh, we'll hear a little bit more. And um, so again, uh, Elisabeth, Jacques, thank you so much for uh, for sharing your knowledge and um, take care. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Everybody. Everybody. It was a pleasure. See everyone. Est-ce qu'on est qu se garde une petite minute pour euh, se timer, Claude?